Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. It's great to be able to open up God's Word with you again this morning. If you've got your Bible there, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. That's where we'll be reading from today. Throughout the autumn here in Carnmoney, we've been thinking about one big question. And the question is this. How do we stay zealous for God for a lifetime? How do we stay zealous for God? It's a big question, isn't it? And actually, it's not just a big question. It's a really good question when you think about it. It's a good question because in our brokenness, sometimes we doubt that we could ever stay passionate for God for the long haul, don't we? Think about this. Throughout the life of faith, we go through mountaintops and valleys and wilderness and a whole load of what you might just call miscellaneous. And actually, many of us here in the room have watched other Christians lose their passion, settle for a shallow Sunday faith, give up on church, or just walk away from God all together, haven't we? And so it's kind of hard then to believe that we actually can stay passionate for God throughout our lives, isn't it? Be honest. And yet, in the last five weeks of our time together, God's Word has been confronting our disbelief by telling us that it actually is possible to sustain a passion for Him throughout our lifetime. It is possible to have zeal throughout our lives. But you know what's even better than that? God's actually given us a blueprint for how to stay zealous. And so far, that blueprint has looked like this. Prioritize worship, especially in God's house. Defend God's honor with your life. Rest in the finished work of Jesus. Repent earnestly, and as we thought about last week, make every effort to do good. And today we're moving on to think about tackling lukewarmth, because Jesus is really clear in Scripture that zeal has no place for lukewarmth. Zeal has no place for lukewarmth. But before we begin this morning, it's worth clarifying what lukewarmth actually is. What is lukewarmth, Shane? Well, lukewarmth or being lukewarm is to be neither hot nor cold. This is lukewarmth. Here is a glass of lukewarm water. This is water that I boiled just before the service started. And actually, you can kind of see a little bit of the condensation. It's neither hot nor cold. It's lukewarm. It's lukewarm in a physical sense. But actually, in a spiritual sense, lukewarm is this, to be indifferent, passive, or half-hearted. And as we'll discover today, lukewarm is absolutely toxic to zeal, so much so that Jesus firmly detests it and he calls us to address it. Today we're looking at Jesus' message to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And to properly unpack what's going on in this passage, we're going to consider two key things. Number one, the problem of lukewarm, and number two, Jesus' beautiful offer of a new reality. So let's get into this passage. This is Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, and this is God's Word. Let's read together. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Now, pause really quickly with me here. In your Bible or in your notes, beside the word angel, just write the word messenger. Jesus is writing this to the messenger of the church in Laodicea. And while that might mean a literal angel, 
there's a better chance that the word angel translates to pastor of the church. Stuart, imagine Jesus wrote you a letter about Carmony Church. I wonder what it would say. Let's continue on. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, i.e., these are the words of Jesus himself. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest or be zealous and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice to open the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. This portion of Revelation 3 is actually really uncomfortable to read. These are some of Jesus' most scathing words to believers throughout the entirety of Scripture. And so it's clear that he has a bone to pick with this church. Verse 16, I am about to spit you out. Verse 17, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow, Jesus. On the surface, at first glance, this doesn't sound like the compassionate Jesus that we see so often throughout the New Testament, does it? So what is Jesus' problem here? What has led Jesus to say these seemingly scathing words to these believers here? Well, in sum, the church had fallen in love with money, which had led them to indifference towards Jesus. If you are making notes this morning, and we always encourage you, make notes. If you're making notes, I'll say that again for you. The church in Laodicea had fallen in love with money, which had led them to indifference or lukewarm towards Jesus. And to understand how this all happened in this church, let me explain the context here because the context makes sense of all of the imagery that Jesus uses throughout this text. Laodicea was a church that had been planted in Asia Minor. You can see a map there behind me on the screen. It's quite simple. This is in modern-day Turkey, and that church was most likely planted around 50 years after Jesus' resurrection. So picture this in your mind, 50 years after Jesus' resurrection. And this church plant, this was most likely planted by Epaphras, who was a disciple of Paul. And Laodicea was situated near the river Lycus on a key trading and communications passageway into the Asia Minor province within the Roman Empire. As a result, Laodicea was a strategic center of commerce for the Romans. And so this city became really wealthy. It was actually so wealthy that around 10 years later in 60 AD, the residents of the city were able to fully rebuild it following a devastating earthquake. And they were able to do it without using a single penny from the Romans they actually rebuilt the city with their own money. And at this point in history, that was almost unheard of. So this is like mega wealth. And yet, and yet, one of the interesting things about Laodicea was that despite its incredible wealth, the water there was almost undrinkable. And this is so key 
to understanding this passage. If you look at the next map that is on the screen, it might help you to picture this even more. Laodicea was built up on a plateau, and so it had no water supply of its own. And so water had to be piped up to it from surrounding areas via aqueducts. And the problem was that by the time fresh water actually got to Laodicea, it had become lukewarm and contaminated. So much so that it was neither hot nor cold. I, the water had become good for very little. The water wasn't hot. It wasn't hot like the springs of Herapolis in the north, in which residents could bathe in or wash their things in. But it wasn't cold either, like the cold running water of neighboring mountain towns, which could be used for drinking or for the sustenance of life. And this is the imagery that Jesus hangs his whole criticism of the church on. Jesus knows that in their wealth and in their status, the church had become self-reliant and ultimately indifferent towards him. So Jesus goes on to say this in verse 16, because you are lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Here, Jesus uses the physical context in Laodicea to clarify his grievance with them. It's crystal clear imagery that the people there would have understood. And actually, it's worth saying this this morning. Contextual imagery is what the book of Revelation is largely characterized. So just to encourage you, Sometimes we read Revelation and we think the imagery is really wild. What's going on? It's hard to understand. But actually the majority of the imagery that is in Revelation, it's used in a way that the believers would have understood. It's understandable to their context. So if you want to understand the book of Revelation more, you should dig into the context. And so here in Revelation chapter 3, the imagery that Jesus uses about lukewarm water points to the physical problem of undrinkable water in Laodicea. It's really smart, isn't it? I don't know if you've noticed, God doesn't waste words like we do. When God speaks to us, he uses language and he uses imagery that we can understand. His voice is clear. But what's also too imperative, what's also imperative to note here, actually, is that the believers in this church in Laodicea, they didn't hate Jesus, and nor did they dislike him. That wasn't Jesus' issue here. Rather, the church had just become indifferent to him. Let me explain it like this. The church just sort of liked Jesus, but they didn't really love him. They were kind of interested by this guy, but they didn't fully surrender to him. They wanted his blessing on their lives, but they didn't want to share it with others. They wanted to be saved from hell, but they didn't want to pick up their cross and follow him. The church in Laodicea had grown indifferent to Jesus. And this is so, so sad because indifference is actually the polar opposite of love. In the famous words of Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel, when commenting on the Nazi genocide of Jews in Germany, the opposite of love is not hate. It's actually indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy. It's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness. The opposite of life is not death. It is indifference. It sadly seems that we can do any evil to people that we are indifferent to. The opposite of loving someone is to feel nothing towards them. 
Hate isn't the opposite of love. Indifference is. And in their wealth and status, the church at Laodicea had grown to feel little towards Jesus. What had once started as a community that was alive and passionate and full of zeal for Jesus now just felt indifferent towards him. How sad is that? And it leads Jesus to say this in verse 17. You say that I am rich and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Again, strong words from Jesus. But what's he really saying here? Well, let's take each descriptive word that he is using in there in verse 17. And if you're making notes, draw a box around each one. Because here, Jesus is intentionally deconstructing what these believers thought that they had because of their wealth and status. Again, it's really smart. Wretched, Jesus is saying, you pride yourself in your good deeds, but you are actually self-reliant and sinful pitiful. You are exalted by the peoples of the earth, but you are pitied by God. Purr. You have material wealth, but you are spiritually purr. Blind. You think that you can see things clearly because you are educated and wealthy, but you are spiritually blind and enslaved by your comfort. Naked. You clothe yourself in luxury, but you're spiritually naked. First Timothy 6 says this, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And this church had fallen in love with money and lost their love of Jesus. This church took the material wealth and blessing of God, which, by the way, was supposed to be used to plant other churches and make Jesus known in the world and actually just bless other people. They took that blessing and that wealth from God and they fell in love with it rather than the source of it. In other words, money was their idol. They fell in love with the blessing, not the source of the blessing. And in so doing, they grew indifferent towards Jesus. They were passive and half-hearted and apathetic. Let me just say this this morning. As those who profess to follow Jesus... This is one of the most grave offenses that we could commit against him. Jesus can work with hatred. He made a persecutor priest called Saul the greatest evangelist in the world. Jesus can work with opposition. He forgave it on the cross. Jesus can work with mistakes. He's really gracious to his feeling followers. And Jesus can work with the tiniest level of faith, faith like a mustard seed. But listen to this from this passage today. Jesus detests indifference among those who bear his name. So as uncomfortable as it might be, let me ask the question, because we can't avoid it. This morning? Are you lukewarm towards Jesus? Have you grown indifferent or passive towards Jesus? You might say, Help me out, Shane. Be more specific. What might this look like for us? Well, here's a few thoughts. Look, warmth might look like doing and saying all of the right things when we gather in here and having no actual love in your heart for Jesus. It might look like staring blankly at a screen while we worship. 
mouthing words that you hardly care about. It might look like secretly holding on to money and status. I wonder how your bank statements look at the end of the month. How's your generosity as followers of Jesus? Look, warmth might seem, look like hearing Jesus speak to you every single Sunday when we gather here in church and yet not responding to him or trying with his help to change and live differently in your Monday through Saturday. It might look like coming to church faithfully your whole life, being a churchgoer, but having no real love for Jesus in your heart, never sharing your faith, living as you please, no regard for Jesus, yet all the while bearing his name with the title Christian. Perhaps lukewarm looks like that. Well, okay, Shane. But what might it look like for us as a church family? Well, it might start with us running programs and not really caring if anybody's actually becoming a Christian or growing in their love of Jesus through what we do. It might start with us becoming self-reliant in our resource and status as a really big, wealthy church. It might start with us becoming fixated on the blessing of God rather than on God himself. And you know what? It will most likely start with us just sitting and settling down. Oh, Lord, we risked big in the past as a congregation. We've come so far as a church, but let's just sit down, God. Let's just enjoy what we have church planting or new ministries or ambition for the kingdom of God or or showing up when things get really hard in here, let's just settle down. Let me just sit in the pew. God, it is this far and no more. And you know what? Isn't that the sad story that is all around us in this moment of church decline? Communities that started so well and which ran hard for years and then just settled down into church politics and bureaucracy and comfort and insular thinking. Settling down seems to me like lukewarm. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus asks the disciple Peter three things. He asked him a question three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Carmoney Church, friends and family gathered here today. Perhaps we're in that kind of moment this morning. Do you love Jesus? Do you really love him? actually love Jesus? Is there lukewarm in your life? Lukewarm is toxic to this lifelong zeal that we are thinking about. And here in Revelation, Jesus makes it really clear that he detests it. But secondly, and we'll go really quick, here is the good news this morning, you can breathe out. Jesus writes this message to this church out of love, and he actually offers them and us a new reality, and this is profoundly beautiful. Look again at verses 19 and 18 in your Bibles. Verse 19, he says this, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. What's pivotal to know in all of this is that Jesus is rebuking this church out of his love for them. Love is always the primary motivation of Jesus. Love is in his very nature. Yes, his words are harsh, and yes, his detest of lukewarm is real, but he rebukes this church to expose the sin that is robbing them of spiritual life in all of its fullness and which has put distance in their relationship. Jesus writes this message because he wants more for them. 
And just like his earlier use of imagery around lukewarm water, Jesus again draws on the context of Laodicea to tell them that they can have a totally new reality if they would choose to repent and come to him. If they would choose to reignite their love for him, if they would choose to be zealous again. Look at verse 18. It says this, I counsel you, I beg you, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus' offer to this church comes in the form of gold, white clothes, and salve. Note this very quickly with me. What's the gold that Jesus is offering to them? The gold is genuine faith. In 1 Peter 7, we read that genuine faith is more precious than gold, gold which will perish. Jesus doesn't want this church to love money, which will one day perish, but instead he wants them to cultivate a genuine faith refined in the fire, which is true, everlasting riches, gold. Jesus wants them to have genuine faith. What about the white clothes, Shane? What are they? Well, Laodicea was renowned for its production of fine black wool. And Jesus is saying that instead of wearing your fine black clothes, come to me and wear my white clothes of forgiveness and cleanliness before God. White clothes. Jesus wants to make them clean and holy. Well then, what about the salve? What is the salve in here? Laodicea was renowned for its medical center, which had discovered this eye powder or salve, which had helped to restore eyesight and which was used to treat eye conditions. And Jesus is saying, come to me to see things as they really are in this world. Come to me for spiritual vision, the salve. Jesus wants them to have his vision of the world. So get this, Not only is Jesus rebuking them out of love, he's actually telling them what they can find in him in a way that makes sense to their context. He's telling them that they can live in an entirely new reality. How beautiful is that? And you know what? He doesn't stop there. Jesus' love goes further still. Stay with me. This is class. Look at verse 20. Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Not only does Jesus offer them an entirely new reality, he actually says this, look, I haven't given up on you. I am still here. I am still knocking on your door, pleading with you to let me in so that I can be close with you. What is this? This is the never-ending, enduring, ever-present love of King Jesus that is always available, even in his rebuke. This is an offer of close proximity, of closeness with Jesus. And there's more. Read on. Jesus' love goes even further. Look at verse 21. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. Jesus says, if you would repent, if you would choose to be zealous, then you can have the hope of eternity with me. Wow. Come on. Wow. Did you track all of that? The movement in this passage is this. Rebuke in love for genuine faith that is available in your life 
forgiveness and holiness that is available in your life, spiritual vision that is available in your life, proximity with Jesus that is available in your life, eternal hope that is available in your life. Jesus is rebuking them so that they can have faith and mercy and vision and proximity and eternal hope. That is an entirely new reality. Come on. How good is that? How good is God? Only He can offer this. But how is it that we get all of that? How is it that we take up Jesus' offer of an entirely new reality? What is the gateway? What is the exchange? It's in verse 19. Verse 19, we choose to zealously, earnestly repent. You know, having zeal is a choice. It's true that we can ask God to help us to be passionate, but actually we have to choose to be zealous zealous in our surrender to Him over and over and over and over and again. We say sorry every day. We depend on Him. We build our lives upon Him. We organize our schedule and our money and our time around Him. And we depend fully on the grace of God to redeem us and change us, and transform us. And let's just be really honest. We're going to fail at this a lot. Let me encourage you with this. In so many places of our lives, we find ourselves to be lukewarm, don't we? But failure doesn't have to be the end of the road with Jesus. I love what the great theologian, basketball player, Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player, I love what he said about failure. I think it helps encourage us on this. Michael Jordan said this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. That's an awful lot. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I have been trusted with the winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over in my life, and that is why I succeed. Carmony Church, Jesus is saying this. Listen to this. You don't have to stay where you're at. In your predisposition to be lukewarm in so many areas of your life, hear my loving rebuke, choose to come to me to get up and to try again. And with my help, you will start to succeed. It might feel slow, but you'll start to be restored. It will absolutely be hard, but you'll learn to live in my new reality with all of the freedom and blessing and purpose and fulfillment that I am offering to you. Folks, Jesus offers us an entirely new reality. And isn't that what we all so desperately want? As we come to the Lord's table this morning, and as we take bread and wine, perhaps the great exchange of this moment is this. Our life for His. Our look warmth for His blazing passion. Passion that took Him all the way to a cross to die for you and me, his body and his blood shed for you and me. Perhaps that is the great exchange of these moments as we come to the table. 
perhaps this morning, as we zealously, earnestly throw ourselves on the grace of God again, we might just discover that it is actually possible to live a life full of zeal. Perhaps we will discover this new reality that Jesus wants so desperately for us. And that is a reality that is full of his blazing passion. Revelation 3 is clear that zeal has no place for lukewarm. In a moment or two, Stuart is going to come and he's going to lead us in communion, which is so fitting this morning. But can I really encourage you, use this time to respond to what God has been saying. Respond in your heart. Respond in the quiet of these moments. Let him expose areas in your life where you have grown indifferent to him, look warm to him. And as you take bread and wine in a moment or two, why don't you ask the Holy Spirit to come and trade your lukewarm thin for his blazing passion. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in these moments of still and of quiet, would you come and would you expose lukewarm where it lies, lives, and exists in our hearts and in our minds, in our attitudes, and in our behaviors. Come and help us to see the error that is in our lives. Help us to hear your rebuke this morning in the tone with which it is given. A tone of love, a tone of invitation, an offer of a new reality. Lord Jesus, as we come to the table, to take bread and wine. Would you take that lukewarm that is so in us? Would you take that lukewarm and would you trade it in for the passion, for the zeal of your son? Zeal which took him to the cross for each one of us. And Lord God, in these moments, for those of us in the room who actually just know that we have no love for Jesus in our hearts anymore. Perhaps those of us in the room who have never known and accepted the love of Jesus, would this be a moment? Would this be a drawing a line in the sand moment? Would salvation come to this house today? Lord God, help us to use this time well, to open our hands and our hearts to you fully in an act of surrender. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we have no words to say that can express that in its fullness. But receive this act of remembrance. Receive it as our surrender again to you, to your kingdom, to your purposes and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit so that we can live more and more into that zealous reality that you want for each one of us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.